Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Prayer. Well, I got to go through a few comments. I didn't see any prayer requests, so we're going to do a general lift up like we usually do when there's no prayer request. If you did put one in and I didn't catch it, I apologize. Um, please repost it here or I'll get it in a little while when I'm able to get back into comments again. Um, it, comments have been weird. I've been having a few troubles with some of that stuff, but it's YouTube. I'm used to it. Uh, you, many other people have the same issue. Um, so the subject tonight is going to be verses about lying. Now, we just I just started a new playlist. I just uploaded a video around 6 about this subject. Um, and two others earlier today about this. This is something that's important for us to understand. But what also we need to understand, because there's not just, hey, you're a liar, calling out or anything like that. Every one of us is a liar. Every one of us has lied. But there's different kinds of lying. God doesn't just excuse any of it, but there's repercussions for the worst kind, really bad ones. But there's hope for people who are lying. If you realize you've lied, confession. Tell him, Lord, I lied. I didn't realize I didn't. I lied. Lord, I felt it. I couldn't fight the temptation. I lied. I told a lie flat out. Admit what you did. Agree with him that it was a lie. If you're faithful to confess, he's faithful to forgive, just like the Bible says. But there is hope for this, and we want to cover scriptures that talk about these things. Because there are times where tell, telling a lie, now last year I talked about this same subject, and people got very bent out of shape about this, because people want to look down on other people who do these things. Well, the thing is, they do them too. They just don't realize it or admit it. There are times when telling a lie can save someone's life. Does that mean you're condemned because you told a lie to save someone's life? No, God knows why you told it. Again, it's not what you do, it's why you're doing it. I can make a mistake with the greatest of intentions. If I don't realize I made a mistake and nobody ever brings it up to me and I never catch it in Scripture, is God going to condemn me for that? No. He's going to look at why I did it. Now, I may lose reward because of that mistake, but there's no condemnation. Let's read through this and then go through some of the Scriptures. Bible verses about liars. What does the Bible say? Understanding God's hope and help for lying. We all lie. Every one of us. I am not excluding myself from any of this. I've done it. I've done it. I do it every day. At some point, I'll tell some kind of lie. And sometimes I don't realize I'm doing it. Sometimes I realize it in the middle of doing it. And then I stop talking. Lying is a temptation like many others we struggle with. Sometimes it seems easier to lie our way out of a situation than admit the truth. But rarely does lying have positive results. Like I said, there's sometimes a lying can save a life. It often leads to hurt, mistrust, and an endless cycle of more lies. It doesn't have to be this way. God, in his wisdom, saw the dangers of lying and the way it would hurt both the liar and the person being lied to. He wanted something better for us. In these Bible verses below, God warns us about lying and encourages trustworthiness. If we are caught in a web of lies, God offers forgiveness and help for a way out. So we're going to go through these scriptures. And, you know, this doesn't, just doesn't apply to the people I was referring to in that playlist that I started today. This applies to every one of us. But for the situation that's happening now, the one I addressed, this is especially important because that kind of lie can hurt a lot of people. You're robbing people of money in that type of lie. That's not good. That's, that's bad, bad, bad business. And there's, there's, you're going to lose. There's going to be, you're going to suffer loss for that. He's not going to just excuse it because you're a Christian. There are certain things that we do. He's, he, he, we're forgiven for them, and the debt's been paid, but we're going to suffer some loss because of it. I know when I stand there, I'm going to suffer loss. There's a, I spent 20 years walking in mistake after mistake. I now see a lot of it was meant to teach me something and how he used it to teach me. But I know I'm still going to suffer loss. I'm prepared mentally for that. I'm prepared spiritually for that. I'm being very honest with myself about this. So blessings for honesty. Proverbs 12.22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Did you know that somebody who lies can be trustworthy? Yeah, that's a weird concept, huh? Think about that. Meditate on that. Like I said, there, there are some lies that save lives. And if a lying saves a life, is it a lie? Just saying that there's weird areas you can get into with this stuff. Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Proverbs 10, 9, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Integrity is a key thing. 
If you tell a white lie every now and then, but your word is true, you, you give your word, you stick by it, are you still in integrity even though you told a white lie? Sure. Did you turn the cold water on while I was taking a shower? No. I did because I flushed the toilet and turned the car to cold water on. That's a white lie. Does that mean I have, I have no integrity? No. That doesn't affect my integrity. Because if I give somebody my word, I keep my word. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Bingo! That's exactly what's going on right now. Philippians 4, 25, 27, and 29. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. That's a hard one sometimes. But you'll find the closer you draw to him, the less, the less you talk nasty. But only what is helpful, helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This is one of the scriptures that I read that got me away from dealing and in partaking in all these attacks that people were doing. That the supposed grace community was loving everybody, but in reality they were starting fights with people. And I was like, whoa, I'm not going to be a part of that. And I actually did a video reading Philippians 4, and this that verse struck me. And I thought, I need to get away from this. this I can't do this. There's a lot of conviction there for a while. 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. Also, a little side note to that, the eyes of the Lord see everything. There is nothing you can hide from him. God tells us not to lie. Exodus 20:16 from the Ten Commandments, you must not lie. I know, I know, don't teach the Ten Commandments. Everybody's scared of the Ten Commandments. I'm not scared of them. First of all, you must not lie is one of the commandments. If you lie, is there going to be problems? Yes. If you don't lie, will there not be problems? Most of the time, yes. You may still get in problems, but at least you weren't the cause of it. The Ten Commandments are still valid today. We don't get saved by them, but they are great indicators of paths to, leave, to lead in life. And plus the scripture says, he who teaches these things, he who b believes these things, and I think it's he who follows these or lives these and teaches men so will be great in heaven. He who denies these things and doesn't teach men so will be least in heaven. So the Ten Commandments are actually an important part of our life. Now, it's, it's the law of... Uh, um, not death. It's in Second First Corinthians. But um, that's for salvation. If you take the precepts contained, and I did videos on this, you can take the precepts contained within the Ten Commandments and apply them as a template to your life. Are you walking in those things? Not perfectly, but generally. If you see areas of improvement, make improvement. You know it's going to make God happy. But you're not following those Ten Commandments in order to be saved. There's a difference. There's an understanding there. A lot of people are scared about this because they don't have the understanding. You have to have the understanding that the law isn't for salvation. The law is meant to show us our errors so we can correct it. Not show us our errors so we can go, yep, that's wrong, and just keep on trucking. Nope. If you find out you're walking in mud, you don't keep walking in mud, do you? You get on a curb. But that's for another video. Proverbs 6, 12 through 13. Let me describe for you a worthless and a wicked man. First, he has a constant liar. Notice he said constant. He signals his true intentions to his friends with eyes and feet and fingers. Talks with his body. Notice what, notice what that said? Talks with his body. His eyes dart around. His feet are always moving on his feet. Can't stand still, especially when you focus on him. His fingers are always moving. You ever see somebody hold their hand down, always flipping their fingers? Those are all indicators of liars. Somebody who can't stop moving. They can't focus on you. They can't make eye contact on you. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. For there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven. Haughtiness. That's high-mindedness. It's pride. Lying. Lying is number two. Murdering. That's also hate, hatefulness. Or being hate, hating someone. Plotting evil. Eagerness to do wrong. A false witness. Sowing discord among brothers. Sowing discord among brothers. Guys, these are scriptures that 
told me to get away from the situation that was going on. I can't be a. I love these people. I love all of them. I can't be a part of what they're doing because what they're doing doesn't align with what the scriptures say. I have no hatred towards them. But I can certainly tell a brother or sister when they're doing something wrong. Consequences for lying. Proverbs 19.9 A false witness shall be punished and a liar shall be caught. What does that tell you? Do these things still apply? I believe so. I wouldn't want to be a, a where everything that I did was based on lies. A, a lie here and there is one thing, but when everything you do is based on it is a whole different story, especially as it pertains to the brethren. This is a big important factor in that. Proverbs 21, 6 and 8, a fortune made by people who tell lies amounts to nothing and leads to death. But the conduct of those who are not guilty is honest. If somebody tells you they're going to Patreon because they're being this and that and the other, and they're trying to go somewhere where they can get you better content, but you got to pay to watch their videos. It is a lie. None of that stuff is happening to me. None of that stuff is happening to hundreds of other people who are doing this. Luke 8, 17, For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. Everything is being written down. Everything is being recorded, and everyone will know it. It will be brought to the open. Psalm 12, 2 through 6. Everyone deceives and flatters and lies. Yes, there is no sincerity left. But the Lord will not deal gently with people who act like that. He will destroy the proud, those proud liars who say we will lie to our heart's content. Our lips are our own. Who can stop us? The Lord replies, I will arise and defend the oppressed, the poor, the needy. I will rescue them as they have longed for me to do so. The Lord's promise is sure. He speaks no careless word. All, this, all he says is purest truth, like silver seven times refined. This is important. Now, if you're just here and there lying because of a situation in that, you, go to, you confess it to the Lord when you realize you did it, or you feel guilty about it, you change your ways... There's a difference between that and somebody who makes it a business and a practice to lie. That's the separation. If somebody lives a lie, like, say, saying they're a Christian when they really aren't, and lying to themselves, denying the word, it, it snowballs. That's a problem. This stuff applies to those people. Now, if you're just a general run-of-the-mill liar like I am, you may lose a reward or two, Depends on what you're lying about and who you're lying to. But that, that's for the Lord to decide. And he'll have mercy on who he'll have mercy. But a person who makes a business of lying, makes a life of lying, and it calls himself a Christian, and does that to the brethren, is in very dangerous territory. The Lord, when he, he's giving everybody ample time to fix this within themselves, not others, my job isn't to make other people change. My job is to do what I was called to do. Be a watchman. Feed the sheep. Lead people in prayer. Whatever this channel gets led to do, that's what I do. It's not to make someone change their ways. They have to make that decision. All I can do is present the truth as it's been given. But the people, when the time comes and judgment comes, the people who lived these things, people who made a practice of these things, the people who made a business of these things, will have to deal with it. I don't know how, I'm not the Lord, but, you know, the Bible is clear. Satan, the father of all lies, John 8, 44, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning and a hater of truth. There is not an iota of truth in him. When he lies, it is perfectly normal, for he is the father of liars. When you make it a practice, a life, a business to lie in any way, I'm talking about something where you perpetuate this and keep it going. And you, fi you find a way to make it okay. You justify your lying. You are aligning yourself with Satan. A Christian can do this. A born-again believer can make this mistake and not, maybe not even realize it. But I venture a guess that in these day and ages, most people realize it. Because the word of God is too easy to get for. Now, God forgives. It's never too late. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. Daniel 9, 9, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness for we have rebelled against him. Here's the thing to understand is every single one of us falls short. None of us have attained any level of greatness. Not one, not point a thousand zeros in a one. It is only through Christ that we have what he has. It is mercy and forgiveness coming from him, not being requested by us. It is given to us from him. All of us fall into that category. But God is merciful. Thank God. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us, his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He saved us while we were in our sin. 1 Timothy 1.15, and that's another great verse to give people who think you can sin and lose your salvation. No. Otherwise, why would he have saved us in our sin? 1 Timothy, you have to wash the car to sell it. Well, in this case, you don't. The car comes dirty and it gets cleaned over time in the driveway. 1 Timothy 1.15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. I can agree with that. I am the worst. God will help you stop lying. Now, this is the answer to this particular problem and all the problems that are involving in this and falling under this category. Philippians 4.13, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. 1 Corinthians 10.13, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Make a mistake, confess it. Don't hold it in, confess it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Each time he said, My grace is all you need, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. Proverbs 3, 5-6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Hello, ding, ding, ding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Let me back up and read that again. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. What you think is right or wrong is irrelevant. It's what God thinks is right or wrong. Seek his will in all you do. Take the Ten Commandments, make a template, lay it on your life. What's out of whack? Simple. Again, I did videos on this. Love and faith. The two commandments John gave in 2 John and 3 John fall all completely within the Ten Commandments. Because all the commandments fall other under either faith or love or a combination of the two. In faith and love you fulfill the whole law. The Bible says that. Amazingly, all the commandments fall under that also. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. If we take the word of God and apply it to our lives, apply it to what we do, apply it to the path we are currently walking, we can see which road. How many people go out there and get on the hood of their car and lay it? Back before GPS, lay the big at road atlas out. I still got them. Lay it out. Okay, we're going down this road, and then we're going to go up here, we're going to do this, and there's this store right here. You know, you're looking at the path, but you're laying it on the path you're on to see whether it lines up. You're looking at the path you're on, and then looking at the road map that you were given to see if you're on the right path. The same thing happens with God. It's the same concept. We seek His will by reading His Word. His Word tells us what His will is for us. We take that will, and we lay it on our life. Let me see what God wants from me. Boom, here it is. Okay, bam, bam, bam. I know these scriptures, these scriptures, these scriptures. All this stuff tells me this isn't for salvation, but look at the life I can live if I abide by even a half of these things. Amazing. I don't have to do it perfectly, but if I add a little bit, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump. That applies to good or bad. And then you see what the will of God is for your life. You see the path you're supposed to follow. It's so simple. And you see the things that are in your life and in your path that shouldn't be there. And you can sweep them to the side. Say, Lord, I don't want that anymore. I rebuke that in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want that in my life anymore. I want you to put something there to replace it that's a thousand times better. And he will do it. So, somebody who's preaching the word in this particular scenario that we've dealt with today, 
If somebody's preaching the word and there's a financial situation going on, what are they to do? Are they to tell people a lie and say, well, it's okay. The Lord said I can make a profit on it. It's in this scripture here. So this is what I'm going to do. And justify yourself? Or do you go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I have this church. There's a problem with making the bills. I'm not going to be able to do this. What is your will for this situation? Are you going to provide the money that I need to be able to move it for this? Or do I need to shut this down and move it to my house? Or move it to a parking lot? Or move it somewhere where these bills are out of the way? Where the financial situation is out of the way? The money is not a factor and should never be a factor. Anybody who has a ministry that says, you know what? We got a financial issue we got to do. I have a financial obligation. No, you do not. The Lord will take care of that. And if he decides, because this is a test. It's a test of your trustworthiness and your faith. If he decides you don't need that church, get it out of there. I want you to do this this way. What are you supposed to say? Well, we're going to make some changes here so we can get this money. We need to go talk and preach to people and tickle the ears of people who got money so we can get big checks coming in here. Y'all need to tithe because tithing is right. I, that's one of my favorite ones I hear. You need to tithe to your church. Where is that at in the Bible? Oh, it's right here. Oh, you mean under the law that was given to the Jews? Where in the Bible does it tell the Gentiles or the church to tithe? It doesn't say tithe. It says give. Tithing is not giving. Tithing, tithing is signing away part of your income. Tithe, tithing is signing away part of everything you own. Giving is giving of your heart. There's a difference, a huge difference. Tithing is a responsibility. Giving is free choice. Freely give and freely you will receive. All these concepts are in the scripture. Everything I'm telling you is in the scripture. But when somebody tries to make it a demand or a responsibility, they are wrong. And the word of God does not support what they're doing. Period. Done. That's it. End of argument. You can give me all the scriptures you want to try to prove yourself right, but you're going to be wrong regardless because there's more scripture supporting the opposite. He does not want you to give because you feel like it's your responsibility to give. He does not want you to give because you think you're going to get a reward back from him if you give. In my mind and in my heart, I know that if I give, I'm going to give it 11%. Because I know that if I give, he gives it back to me running over. And you know what, what people do to justify that? They take it back off their taxes. Well, then what have you given? If you give money, if you donate, and then take it back off your taxes, what have you given? Here's the justification I've heard. Well, I get it back so I can give it again. Okay, so you're just ro rotating the same gift. You're not giving of yourself. You've got a set amount of money set aside. And you cycle that through giving it every time. What have you given? It's now become a responsibility. It's now become a duty. And that's not what he intended. He wanted you to give from your heart. Give of your time. Give of yourself. The money is already his. The land, the stuff, it's, it's all his. It all belonged to him. He created it. He wants you to give of you. But when somebody makes it, tries to justify it, making finances part of the responsibility of preaching the gospel they have made an egregious error and the word of god speaks against this this is why you have to have a line that you draw and never cross it once you figure out what the word of god says and what god's desire is you have to draw a line right there and say i'm not going to go outside of what the word of god says they're going to get mad at you people get get mad at me when I, when i say these things but you can take everything to the word of god and prove it everything and I show you scripture that talks about this it's simple and when we walk in these precepts the blessings come pouring over and we don't do it to get the blessings we do it because it's the right thing to do so now that I've got, got on my soapbox ranted again I haven't done a ranty video in a while here's here's one um, this is simple guys and when we operate here's another great thing when we operate in that concept and in that idea, in that frame of mind, peace and joy come from it. Because we're not going through like an obligatory movement in order to please God. He wants us to do everything from our heart. There's more power in a desire to do things a certain way that align with God's will than actually doing them. Because you can do them but complain. You can do them but feel like it's a duty. You can do them and have the wrong thing in your heart. He's looking at what the right thing is in your heart. 
Did he care that Job was a big old fat dude with big old blobs of fat in his legs and big old cheeks and flops of skin everywhere after he got sick? No, he didn't care about that. Job was righteous. Didn't matter what he looked like. It was what was in his heart. What about Lot? Thought he could, he could handle it living in Sodom and Gomorrah. How many times do you think that dude was had to partake in some of the stuff that was going on there. How many times do you think his wife did? You can't live in the city like that. After what I learned about that city and what they found out historically happened there, there's no way they lived there without that stuff happening. How he kept his da daughter's virgins, I have no idea. Yet he was still righteous. The desire in his heart was different than what his actions were. Sometimes your actions and the desire in your heart don't match up. God is looking at the desire in your heart. And if your desire is the end result to be something else, there it is. Now, you can try to justify lying with that, but this is all going to be according to his judgment. Let's get into some prayer. Lord, we come before you this evening with a great level of thanksgiving. We give thanks for you giving us the simple truth contained within your word and to give us discernment. Because with truth, there has to be discernment. So we can discern what's truth and what isn't. And discern it as it applies to others and what they're doing not so we can tell them about it, so we can avoid if it's wrong. Your word is clear. Your word is simple. If our desire is to apply it to our lives and to live by these concepts, but if our desire isn't, your word is always complicated and people fail to understand it. Amazingly, your word talks about that. We have situations come up all the time in the Christian community and in the church where people are using deception to get by, to progress. They're not waiting on you to answer their prayers, or they're not even coming to you in prayer at all. What do we do in those situations? If we have discernment and we're walking in as much truth as we can, we know we can't do it perfect. We avoid those situations and avoid those people and don't align ourselves with those things. You told us, if you agree them, you agree with them. You're aligning yourself with that. Avoid them at all costs. When John was in in front of Serenthus in the bathhouse and he ran from the bathhouse. I don't even want to be in the same place with this guy. His evil may rub off on me and if God decides to judge him and bring this house down on him, I don't want to be here. This is why we have to avoid these things. I, Lord, you know I have no hatred towards anyone, whether I agree with him or disagree with him. But you know also, especially after what happened a couple months ago, I can't align myself with that. And I'm not going to align myself with that. It's not, it's not correct to say those things and to mislead people like that. I don't want to be aligned with that. We praise you and glorify you for awakening us and opening our eyes to see the truth. There are people that are still caught up in these deceptions. Lord, I pray you open their eyes. I'm going to lift everybody up by intercession tonight. All the brothers and sisters who are not awake, who are caught up in these deceptions, who don't see what's happening right in front of them, I pray you open their eyes to see, open their minds to know, and open their hearts to understand. Lord, I pray right now you give them discernment so that they will be able to tell the difference. Many people that are on my channel are here because you've opened their eyes. They see the truth. They see your word and they see how it applies and it's simple. They see what your will is and they're acting on it. They're responding to the word just like you said in Revelations. Are you responding to me? Are you responding to my word? We're not perfect. We still make mistakes. But you've led us to a place that is amazing because we see these things so clearly and go, ah, I'm not going to get involved in that. That's not a good idea. And we avoid it. And the peace that comes across our lives, the peace that defies all understanding, that it lives in our hearts, magnifies because of this because we avoid that stress and drama that we're not supposed to partake in anyway if we know the truth why do we deny it if we know what the right thing is to do why do we still do the wrong thing we're all guilty but you have chosen to open up the eyes of those who have the desire to follow you and the desire to be with you and the desire to walk with you and the desire to fulfill your will in their lives as best they can. I pray that you do that to all the brethren that believe. Because there are some that are still caught up in these things. And they're still confused. And I feel for them. But I can only give them what you give me. I can't convince them. They have to make that decision. I'm imploring you now by intercession 
to open them up so they can see it, so they can view it, so they can receive it and understand it and discern it and turn from it and come to your word, not to me, to you and your word and seek the truth and find the truth and stand up as their own Christian, like it was intended to be, not living on the coattails or riding the coattails of someone else. Be their own warrior for Christ. Be their own minister. Be their own preacher. Be their own pastor. Be their own truth giver. Feed the sheep. If we could attain 1% of what your desire is for us, how amazing, how much could we get done by praying for it? But well, we're praying for it tonight. I lift them up, Lord. Those that are getting caught up in these deceptions, that are doing, you know, that are getting money in front, I pray you knock that desire out of them. Rip it out of them. Cut it out. Don't rip it. You rip it, it leaves jagged edges. It can seal back up. Cut it out. Clean cut. And replace it with a desire to serve you only. Not money. Not the world. Not man. And do nothing to bring the truth. The money is off the table. You provide everything we need. If their church fails, so be it. They can do it in the parking lot. They can do it in their house. I do it on YouTube. There's no reason why they need to make money a factor in this. Now, certain ministries, you push them and you provide them the money and they go on. Great. That's, a, that's what you, your desire is for them. But we know that there's an issue here. And I pray that you resolve this issue. Because there's a lot of people that I care about. A lot of people I was friends with. And had great conversations with. And loved fellowshipping with them, but I had to walk away from them because they got caught up in this and they're moving forward with it. And I don't want to see that happen. Well, I know this is a test, but I, I pray people pass it. Strengthen us. Refresh us. Build us up. Fill us with your word. Fill us with your truth and with your understanding. Every one of us. That we may walk forward and present that truth. And when faced with these kinds of things, can answer correctly and honestly from your truth in the Bible with your Holy Spirit pushing us and guiding us and directing the way we should go. Recalling your word to us in a moment's notice, whether we memorize it or not, so that we can give an answer and we can thwart the devil and his minions and thwart the evil that exists on this earth in these last days. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your mercy and grace, for your guidance, for your truth, for what you have done in the church today, how you have called out the body how you've laid down the test and the gauntlet to show who's with you and who isn't. And we clearly see who's heading the right way and who's maybe leaning off on the shoulder a little bit and steering off into the ditch. We pray for them. That We pray for ourselves too, but we pray for them to get them back on the path, back in the center where the light is, following that dotted line right to you. In your name, Lord, I lift up all my brethren for peace, for strength, for guidance, and for truth. And in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for evening prayer. Um, well, I didn't even read Proverbs 12.20. The peace verse. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil. But those who plan peace have joy. I was so rolling with the Spirit, I didn't even catch it. I totally forgot about it. But there it is right there. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil. So deceit, lying, and evil go hand in hand. Now, does that mean everybody who lies is evil? No. But that's a path you start to walk down, and once you get fully in it, it's hard to get back off of it. But like we read earlier in the scriptures, there is, and I'll link that in the description, there is a way out. No matter how many steps you take away from God, there's only one step to get back. Turn around. Reconsider change your mind repent and go back to the lord what, what did i do why did i make this mistake show me the right way i don't want to do this anymore and he will pull you back he'll grab you by the hair it's going to hurt grab you by the hair and jerk you out of the fire because that's what his desire is but he's not going to make us do it we have to make the choice read these scriptures study these scriptures Contemplate what I've told you. Meditate on what the Lord says about these things. Do your own studies on this.
because the richness that comes into your understanding and the strengthening of your spirit within you by doing this is beyond description. You will never, ever be led into deception again. You will instantly see it and turn away from it. You'll have a word when the word is appropriate. The spirit will speak through you every time. You don't have to think about what you have to say. I know because it's happening to me. Don't let them lie to you. Don't let them deceive you. Don't agree with what they're doing that's wrong and, and doesn't accord with God's word. If it, You don't have to hate a person if they do something or say something that doesn't accord with God's word. If you can correct it, correct it. If they're a Christian, they'll receive it. If they're not, you may have to make a decision to walk away from that person and not listen to them anymore. I have people on my channel that listen to me and maybe one other person, maybe two other people. Because so many people are lost. Not lost in salvation, lost in the, from the truth. It's a terrible state that the church is in. I love you guys very much. And I know this stuff is kind of rough. But this is the truth we have to face. This is the, the specific stuff the Lord talks about in the Bible we have to face. Because if we don't, we'll never know to watch out for it. To avoid it. If I tell you there's a three foot deep pothole right in the middle of the highway and you avoid it, you've saved your suspension on your car. If I don't, if I don't warn you, you hit it, ripped, I've seen front tires and suspensions ripped off vehicles from hitting potholes, literally ripped off the frame from hitting potholes. The damage, thousands of dollars in damage. What good am I if I didn't warn you when I knew about it? This is what I'm called to do. I'm a watchman. I'm sounding the alarm. I'll see you guys in the next video.